her finale was to act like a cat. For one minute, she recited, I'm a kitten, meow, meow, meow. I'm a kitten, meow, meow, meow. <laughs> oh, but, but Kate was a bully. Kate made her cry. But Ellen DeGeneres telling her to go squat in the street and suck from a baby bottle while saying mommy wants some milk is totally fine. We're friends. That's what friends do. Okay, uh, this is humiliation beyond comprehension. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review. And we are so close to being done. This is our second to last episode because we're covering two chapters today. The first chapter we're going to uh, talk about is chapter 40. It's called Grandstanding. And then after that, there's a real short chapter called Victory. Uh, but essentially, uh, I have gone ahead and read through the end of the book. Essentially, from here on out, we're just going to be talking about what terrible people they are and how they are continually trying to scale to the next victory. Um, I feel like I was... I was reading this in the car as we were driving back from the beach. And the thought occurred to me that if we were living in a landscape in which the sun was a burning ball of hot garbage juice and the mountains were made out of roadkill carcass and feces and the lakes were nothing but stretches of cat urine, it could not be worse than the moral state in which Harry and Meghan exist in 24-7 the decisions that they're making, the choices that they're choosing. It's not new, but it astounds me that they are so incapable of looking at the life that they are living and going like, is this who we really wanna be? Is this what we really want? Is this how we wanna raise our kids to just be these, these people clutching for fame at, at any expense? And one of the things that is pervasive throughout the end of this book is how many times they have to pay for the honors that they gain and how many times they have to manipulate institutions to see them and none of it is 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 honest none of it is forthcoming uh we're gonna be talking about their from from here on out and it's just crazy to me we're gonna be talking about their foundation and how sketchy it is like where's the money that they're pledging to various people you know and i'm like is this pledging in the amber heard sense i mean did anybody ever see this money i pledged to do this i pledged to do that well did you though like are we going to follow up on any of this you know it's wild but anyway i just want to get into it since we do the two chapters they're pretty short but you know i took a long time to tell a story now this chapter begins with Tom Bauer telling about how all the internet was kind of up in arms about Harry and Meghan. Like we were coming to a point now where it was like, those people are a couple of snakes. The Oprah interview didn't do them any favors. I mean, I think that they did them some favors for like five seconds. And then people were like, yeah, but you know what? They're like a prince and a duchess. What are they crying about? You know, people just did not have any patience for them. So at that time, some of the stuff that was coming up in the I wouldn't even say it was the media. It was just all online gossipy, like social media trash. It was like in the comments. But in the comments, people were saying things like how Megan had insulted Tyler Perry's staff and the Sussexes had left his house after an argument. Megan had, Megan was cursing that Harry spent too much time with Brits living in Los Angeles. George Lucas, the film director and a neighbor in Montecito was irritated by the Sussexes. People were gossiping about how Megan wrote on stationary and boss with a gold M under a golden crown. Some people wanted to talk about how Netflix and Spotify were dissatisfied by the Sussexes' lack of product. Archie was never seen playing with the local children. Yeah, that's weird. And Harry was seen every morning smoking weed in his garden. Richard Minyards, a former journalist living near Montecito, gave the London Evening Standard the opposite report. He said the Sussexes were happily integrated into the neighborhood. Well, you know, there's always gonna be that one person who's like, what can I get out of it by saying something nice? You know, so, of course, Richard wanted to let everybody know they're really great. Tom Bauer t says that it's vicious gossip. Well, it is gossipy, but I mean, it is also true. Where is Archie? We never see him. You know, the Netflix and Spotify, they have been dissatisfied with the product. You know, they paid for something and where is it? You know, so I mean, gossip, but like gossip kind of makes you feel like it's just people coming up with stuff. No, I mean, this is true stuff. 
she did use stationery embossed with a gold M under a golden crown. Like, that is true. She did do that. So, I mean, perhaps it is. I mean, I guess it's gospel to keep on and on. I mean, what, if, what difference does it make to us if Tyler Perry ran them out on a rail? But it is interesting. And I wouldn't say it's untrue. But they didn't really care. I mean, the Sussexes are like, you know, their whole world has been to silence the trolls, but only because they didn't have something bigger and better to focus their energy on. Now that they are like making deals hand over fist, you know, yeah, the trolls are annoying, but like they'll have the final word, kind of is how they're thinking now. The Sussex had good reason to ignore the trolls. Their astute team was completing the jigsaw to establish them as major players in America. Their deadline was three months away. Negotiations were nearly completed to sign a four book deal. Oh, you guys, I had no idea it was a four book deal. Who's writing these four books? It can't be, you know, illiterate Megan, who you guys were going to talk about that book, The Bench, she wrote, that little children's book. Oh my gosh. It's like the worst thing I've ever seen, like literally. And I'm really choosy about kids' books. I mean, not much makes the cut for my kids, but this is like one of the worst things I've ever seen just on like on on, on on a level of literacy like these poems june moon soon tune it's like what is this who told her this was okay anyway they've got a four book deal okay but we've seen what harry was able to come up with with a ghost writer and they think they're going to churn out three more of these things like what are they going to do what are they even going to talk about what, how, how, what more can they reveal I don't know. Okay, so uh, the first title to be published in late 2022, 20, don't we know it, was to be Harry's intimate and heartfelt memoir. Ghost written by the American journalist J.R. Moringer, Harry's book promised to deliver an accurate, what, and wholly truthful, definitive account about the losses and the life lessons that have helped to shape him to earn the estimated advance of about 20 million pounds. Harry would be expected to give Mo Ringer emotional confessions and secret details. Well, we got secret details, all right. Okay. I think this is the most pertinent thing though that's yet uh, yeah, that we've heard because Bauer goes on to say that these were to settle his scores with his family and friends, but that Megan was expected to help the ghost writer understand the pain inflicted by the royal family and on herself and Harry. <laughs> yeah, it's so obvious that Megan was the one like keeping the appointments with the old ghostwriter. And that, now I've heard repeatedly that the ghostwriter quit. I never really looked into that that much. Like I didn't need, regardless of who was working on it, ghostwriter, Megan, Harry, the book was a piece of trash, okay? And if you haven't gone back to listen to the extended review I did of that book, go do yourself a favor. Uh, because that book was so much garbage it defied anything that I had expected. Like I did not have high standards going into that book. I mean, I was like, it's gonna be some garbage, but like he got some help, right? <laughs> when I think about how stupid that book was, I can't even believe I read the whole thing and talked about it for like 30 episodes. Anyway, okay, yeah, they wrote a book all right. I can't even imagine how they think they got through more of them. I can't even imagine, like what, what further details can you give us? You gonna talk about like, you know, one time you and William were sitting around and then the nanny gave you a snack and William got a couple more crackers than you did. I mean, like, what is left to say, you know? If he writes another book, I guarantee you he's going to play on, like, he and Diana. So, like, the next book, I'll bet you anything, is going to be, like, uh, my special relationship with my mom and I'm like but you didn't really know her because you were like 11 when she died and she never spent any time with you anyway so what are you talking about but I guarantee you the next book's gonna have something to do with Diana or like he's gonna talk about like how Diana helped him his whole life as far as like when he was a kid their super close relationship and how like him and his mom really got something special that he and William never had and that like now that he's gone into adulthood she's not there but she is there and these are all the ways that he's known that she's there and it'll be a lot of him like talking about how animals have been talking to him you know the birds twittered in a certain way and he knew it was mama like because we got a lot of that in spare but I guarantee you the next book's going to play on Diana. It's the only thing he has that anybody even gives any, any care about whatsoever. 
he only has one thing he can say. He walked behind her, her coffin. You know, I mean, we've heard that so many times. But he, his next book will be about Diana. I can guarantee it. And I mean, I would bet like a ton of money on it. Bauer goes on to discuss the book. He said among the targets besides William, Kate, and Charles would be, of course, Camilla. Megan had identified her as a racist. Publication was sensitively timed for after the end of the celebrations of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee in June. By definition, Harry excluded describing the advantages bestowed on himself. By any count, Harry was one of the most privileged men. The further threat was the announcement of his second book, which would be published after the Queen's death. Well, where is it, Harry? She's not with us anymore. We'd like to see the second one. The announcement of Harry's deal coincided with the publication of Megan's illustrated children's book, The Bench. Oh, you guys. So I went and I looked up The Bench, right? I never read that sorry thing. Who would? Um, and so there's just so much trash out there for kids. Quite frankly, if a book has been written before 1965, I really do consider whether I should or should not read it to my children because usually it's going to be drivel and trash. But this particular book uh, exceeded even my low expectations for garbage. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I already was not expecting it to be great. You know, the illustrations were less than beautiful. I mean, you know, it's just like a bunch of watercolor that could have been done by like a skilled sixth grader. And, and, and even that, I, I'm not even sure, but I mean, even aside from the illustrations, all right, at least they were watercolor and not done by a computer. I, I have like extreme issues with children's books where the illustrations are like trash because for children, part of the joy of looking at a book, especially before they're literate, is the, is the beautiful illustrations. And if I'm trying to teach my child about what is good, true, and beautiful, giving them a book that has been illustrated by a computer, um, where's the skill? Like, what, what is there for them to attain to as they look at these clunky pictures? Uh, but anyway, at least she did have a watercolorist do her paintings for her in the book. But all that aside, the actual content of this book was so lame. All right, she writes this book, right? She anticipates that it's gonna be the sensational bestseller. It's 34 pages, but it's like a line of page, you know? So it's not, it's not too in depth. And it was all inspired by a poem she wrote for Harry on Father's Day after Archie was born. So the dedication line wrote, for the man and boy who make my heart go pump, pump. What? That's embarrassing. And she wrote about the inspiration um, in this, about this book, she wanted to depict the special bond through an inclusive lens. In particular, she wanted to highlight the softness of masculinity and fatherhood through the warmth and joy and comfort of the relationship between fathers and sons. I mean, ignore the fact that she and Harry don't have a relationship with their dads, you know, but they know all about what good parents are and, you know, the, the special bond between fathers and sons and or fathers and daughters if you want to talk inclusivity you know and so the whole book is like a bunch of pictures of like dads and their sons and everything like that and it's you know it'd be a fine idea but the whole book is like based on like this is the bench where you will sit and watch him as he grows and you know this is the bench where you guys are gonna like take naps out in the sun and this is the bench where you'll kiss his like boo-boos and his owies when he's sad this is the bench where I'll see you playing with him while I look out the kitchen window, tears of joy streaming down my face. But she sets it all to rhyme. I, man, I meant to have like a copy of it. If you want to like put a bullet through your head, go read it. But, um, it's terrible. And I can't even believe anybody was like, yeah, this is great. You don't need any help with this. It is horrific. And it's total failure as a children's book. I mean, that's pretty much all I can say there. I feel like the reason she wrote it was as yet another middle finger to both her father and Charles so that she could essentially be saying, you guys failed us, but despite your failures, we can identify what good fathering is. And this is actually what it looks like sitting on a bench and, you know, being there for your kid, you know, sitting on the bench and watching them play at the playground, sitting on the bench and eating a snack, sitting on the bench and taking a nap, sitting on the bench and being a comfort to them when they hurt themselves. That is true fatherhood. Now, we didn't get it from you guys. I mean, you didn't help Harry figure it out. My dad certainly didn't help me figure it out, but we prevailed in our maturity. So much so that I can now write a book. <laughs> we didn't need you after all. We don't need you now. 
The critics were harsh, weren't they ever? This is hilarious. Megan was too controversial to attract generosity. The Daily Telegraph commented that her semi-literate book leaves Harry holding the baby. Yeah, that is what's, it's so weird. Like all the illustrations, she's kind of like in the background. She's like gardening while Harry's helping her, like Archie feed the chickens. There's a picture of like a mom weeping at a window while she watches the reuniting of her soldier husband with the young child who's like come back from war or something. And it's like, why are you never like in the, it, like in it though? You know, and it's, it's just like, you know, I know the book is supposed to be like from her point, point of view as she looks on, but the whole book kind of seems like she's letting the father take all the responsibility of childhood. Somehow she fails to make it seem as though they're parenting together, but she's watching him. The whole book feels like he's doing all the work and then she's like almost like this ghostly figure in the background, like watching as it all happens. It's odd, it's a, it's a strange book. Another complaint that the semi-literate vanity project limps along. It does, it does y'all. Others question the book's remarkable similarity to The Boy on the Bench, published in 2018. Ranked 4,934 on, on Britain's Amazon after two weeks, The Bench did reach the top 2,000 in America. Within days, the bad reviews were unimportant because Megan had successfully executed two other appearances. And we will talk about those two other appearances. I do want to say one thing, though. I was really interested by this statement where it said, others questioned the book's remarkable similarity to The Boy on the Bench, published in 2018. Actually, Bauer misquotes the title. He says The Boy and the Bench. That's not the title of the book. And when I went to go and look up and see what that book was about, I wouldn't really say they were similar at all. The boy on the bench is about a boy sitting at a playground with his dad and then he's too nervous to go play with the other kids in this packed playground and then he sees somebody in distress, they've lost a toy, he goes to help. Um, and I, I think like the dad encourages him to do it. Well, I mean, there's a bench and there's a dad, but I wouldn't say it was like plagiarism. And so, you know, it's like, I want to just be so careful with things like that because now that is gossipy to be like, oh, she plagiarized this book. I mean, maybe she did read the book about the dad on the bench or whatever, but I mean, dads sit on benches all the time at the playground or out in the garden or whatever. You know, it's not like exactly plagiarism. And I just, there's just enough to criticize Megan about that I think that it's, you don't want to ever lose the edge of the criticism by throwing in false allegations because then that muddles the, and it, you know, it, it makes things murky as to where your specific points of critique should land. So I wish he hadn't included that because it's not really worth saying. But anyway, be that as it may be. The book on its own merit was terrible and it doesn't even have to, we don't even have to criticize it because it could have been plagiarized. It wasn't, in my, in my estimation, I don't think it's plagiarized. I just think it was a piece of trash. Okay, well, Megan was like, whatever about the book. Okay, because I have a new plan now. It's called 40 for 40. You guys listen to this hellacious plan and I remember hearing about it at the time and being like well that's lame like that's the, like, the lamest thing I've ever heard like that's the that's the greatest embarrassment I have ever seen or heard about and the fact that there was so little follow-up to it okay so this was the plan this is her 40 for 40 right so Megan's turning 40 and her big plan was to get 40 notable women to spend 40 minutes with 40 different ladies and try to figure out how to get them back on track after the COVID break. Like, let's get them some work. How are you gonna do that in 40 minutes? You know? And, 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 and you know, what, what, what is like, you know, Melissa McCarthy gonna do for me in 40 minutes? And like, we don't have any idea who these 40 women were. The, we don't know anything about this project. Who were the 40 celebrities that were gonna like climb off of their you know, climb off of Mount Olympia and like come help the, the poor urchins in the streets, you know, and you know, give them 40 golden minutes to figure out how to get employment. You know, it's like, you're gonna need more than 40 minutes to find a new job. And like, what is this person gonna do? They're gonna go and like help you fill out applications at the Best Buy? Like literally, what are you talking about? 40 minutes, like what? Who are these people? Like how, how awkward would that be? Like you're already in a very vulnerable position. You don't have work. And then like this gorgeous, with it, celebrity comes and they're like, okay, how are you gonna, hi, my name's, you know, I'm Cameron Diaz, what's, okay, your name's Jenny, okay, well, Jenny, like, what was your work before COVID, okay, you worked at a daycare, all right, um, 
and you can't find work at another daycare. Okay, um, well, maybe we could Google some option. It's like, how, who, what, what, what plan was this? It's so embarrassing. It's so cringe on every level. And no, no wonder she couldn't actually find 40 people to be involved on either end, right? Tom Bauer writes, he says, on her 40th birthday, she issued a video launching her 40 for 40 initiative. Filmed in her house behind a large table piled with her book, she explained how a clutch of famous women had been recruited to devote 40 minutes each to help women return to work after the pandemic. Although she did not explain what could be achieved in 40 minutes, and the humor in the brief video of comic actress Melissa McCarthy fell flat, the snapshot raised her profile and reaffirmed her commitment to women's empowerment. The results were never revealed, but the next jigsaw piece was even more profound. Okay, so she's done her little 40 for 40, you know, initiative. She said she wants to help people. This is, this is really honestly very much like when Amber Heard talked about, well, I pledged the money, you know, because yeah, you said, you set up this lame plan but what did you ever do to fulfill the lame plan? We have never seen the light of day to any of this. Where are any of the 40 women who were helped? Who are any of the 40 women who had, you know, condescended to come help in the first place? Okay, so she, she came up with the initiative, just like Amber Heard pledged the money, all right? And, uh, but the next thing that she decided to like dip her toe in the political waters, she started cold calling these different politicians. She called the senators from Maine and the senators from West Virginia and she's like, you know what I think you guys need to do? You need to vote that moms should get more time off after they have a baby. That should be something that's a huge priority for you. Okay. Well, uh, it would be nice to get more paid, you know, time off until you could spend with your baby, but both senators appeared underwhelmed by the calls. Not least, both found it ironic that Megan should use her royal title because she called them introducing herself as uh, hi, this is Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. You know, she could have just said Meghan Markle. We know who that is, too. But no, hi, this is Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. I think you need to make sure moms get more time off after they have their babies. Yeah, because Megan cared so much about that, even though she is the one who said, I don't need time off because I love to work. So I'm not going to be taking any paid leave. Remember that? When she was at like, the royal... When, when back on her royal duties and she made a big stink about the fact that she loves work so much and she's so committed to the job that she didn't need any time off. But yet she wants to make it like this big thing that moms should be spending time with their babies. Well, what about you, Megan? Didn't you want to spend time with Archie? Lily Bat? And uh, you're not worried about that? Okay, but she wants to make sure that everybody knows that it's important. Look, I do think it's important, but what would be even greater is if we could live in a society in which it didn't have to be two people working and one person would be free to take care of the kids. That is the society that I'd love to live in. You know, I'm not saying that you couldn't have like your side thing that you could do and that it would be great if you had time to do something that was just like your own passion project as a mother. But like, wouldn't it be great if you lived in a society where it was a potential for like one person to earn a very decent living and the other person could be solely devoted to running this shit? Because let me tell you, taking care of the kids, taking care of school, taking care of the food, that is a job in of itself. That is a huge job in of itself. And wouldn't it be nice if we lived in a world where both people didn't have to work so you could just inch along in life? All right, but that's for another podcast. Anyway, she says let's give them some more time, even though she personally didn't think that she needed it. Um, and it is interesting that she should call herself Megan the Duchess of Sussex, particularly because, do we recall back when she was interviewed for Vanity Fair and she said that she had never defined herself by her relationships? And yet, this relationship to the royal family is the only thing that's keeping her going, so she's always got to introduce herself as, Hi, I'm Megan the Duchess of Sussex. Well, nobody really cared. Those two senators were less than impressed, so she moved on. The two telephone calls were preceded by letters from Megan to the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. To support her cause, the Duchess of Sussex described her childhood to the po politicians as poor. I grew up on the 499 salad bar at Sizzler. And she also repeated once again how she had worked at the age of 13 at a local yogurt shop. Quite frankly, who gives a damn, right? I mean, how many of us grew up poor? I grew up poor as dirt. I mean, I had nothing, you know? And it's like, I'm, you know, I, ha I have way more now than I had as a kid, right? But how many of us have that story where like, 
our parents were struggling when we were growing up and and you know you you had to share a bedroom and you wore hand-me-downs from your cousins and you know it's like some of us were way you know were much worse off than even that you know but you don't see us writing letters to the senators being like i think you should do what i tell you to do because i grew up poor it's like all right well like so did most of us you know and as the world goes on and people are finding a higher standard of living and different ways to make money, you know, life can get a little better for you. But it's not a feather in your cap because you grew up poor. Yeah, you and everybody else. I mean, so few people are living up in that 1%, okay? And just because now, Megan, you live in the top 1%, that's not where most people live. So it's nothing... It's nothing to anybody that you grew up poor and you had to eat, you know, the $4.99 salad bar at Sizzler. Thank God you had something to eat. All right, tell that to the children in Africa who would love to have $4.99 Sizzler salad. Okay, and this job at the yogurt shop, you and everybody else had to work. Okay, and believe me, 13 years old at the yogurt shop, they couldn't even employ you at age 13 at the yogurt shop. You had to be at least 15, so even that's a bunch of BS. But we know you didn't have a job because your dad said that he never wanted you to work. He wanted you to focus on school, and you never even had a summer job. Okay, so you go 13, hey, there I was, a child worker at the yogurt shop, you know, chomping on my salad between, you know, during my 15-minute breaks. Please. Harry and Meghan were on a roll, though. They voiced concern that the world was exceptionally fragile. And what is astounding to me is they came out and they their two pain, their two pain points that they hammered on about saying the world is so fragile. By the way, yes, the world is fragile. You know, we're hanging in the balance here. But they were really upset, like we all were, during the Afghanistan situation in which America just inexplicably pulled out and let the Taliban take over everything. And we literally gave them billions of dollars of equipment so they could just you know party on after everything that had been done in that country and that's what the, that, that that that's what happened you know we, we could we couldn't even just like pace ourselves to get out in a timely fashion so that the people who were there weren't stranded and murdered and raped i mean yeah that was a fiasco right so yeah if they were upset about it yeah me too megan and harry it is a little concerning the way that worked out okay uh, but then they were also left scared by the new variants and the constant mis misinformation about COVID. Right. Well, you guys, I'm not, I, <laughs> COVID was a hot mess. All right. We know that there is so much misinformation inexplicably. And the only thing we can determine at this point was that it was a control mechanism to see what they could get us to agree to do. Uh, that's not a conspiracy theory. There's too much that's come out now. We, you know, and anybody who was paying attention at the time was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, that doesn't make sense, you know? Stupid plexiglass in front of like, people's faces, children in band practice who had to wear a mask but cut a hole in the mask so that they could play the saxophone. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there was just too much that was like, well, that's a bunch of BS, why am I doing this? Yeah, we're all having to do it. The mandatory vaccine and all this. It's a bunch of BS. It was all to control our movements. All right, okay. But Megan and Harry want to complain about Afghanistan. They want to complain about the misinformation about COVID and like why the rules keep switching. And what I think is really ironic, and this is not me being political, I'm just stating the truth. The political alignment that they have hewn for themselves it's peculiar that they're wanting to criticize the fragility of the world in this Afghan, in, the, in this post-Afghanistan situation, COVID misinformation situation. And it's like, but you understand that the party that you're supporting is also uh, heavily influencing both of those things that you are so distraught about. Look, I think that both political parties are a hot, mess. I think that there are liars on both sides. I think that, it, that the lies go straight up to the top on both sides. I am sickened by most of the things that I see in American politics. So this is not me taking sides on e in either way. Okay, but what I am saying to you is Megan and Harry to complain about Afghanistan and to complain about COVID misinformation is to complain against the very party that they've aligned themselves with and have, you know, gotten into the bed with and rolled around with, you know, all these people who they are, you know, wanting this attention and this accolades and these relationships 
those are the very people making decisions that you are so opposed to. Okay, whatever. Harry and Meghan, hypocrisy is your brand. That is what you like to do. So does it surprise me that you would support these people and then complain about the policies? No. Does it surprise me that right after they get finished saying that the world is hanging in the balance and it's so fragile and that you know the climate crisis is going to take us all down and then go from Aspen to Santa Barbara in a private plane right after you finish telling Oprah that climate change is the most pressing issue facing the world ever? No, because you people are hypocrites. You're always going to say one thing and do another or do one thing and say another without exception. So no, I'm not surprised. If you weren't hypocrites, you probably wouldn't even be alive. It's like your lifeblood here. The truth is that the world was just at this point where we're at like 20, 21, 2022, we're getting sick and tired of the Meghan and Harry show. Okay. We're tired of it. And this became really apparent and clear when there was a clip of the Oprah Winfrey show, um, that interview, uh, there was a clip shown at the national TV award ceremony in London in September. And there was a resounding booing and hissing when the, when the clip came up and there was a dispute whether the boos were for the Sussexes or for Oprah for seeking accolades for the interview. Either way, the Sussexes relied on Toya Holness to suffocate any negative voices directed against them. So no, Toya Holness was their spin doctor at the moment. Now she's not going to last to the end of the book, but at this point in time, she was the one who tottered out and tried to recreate the narrative. Uh, Toya Holness is probably one of the sorriest ambassadors they've had yet. And one of the things that she decided to do that only cements her sorriness was that she decided to recruit in New York, a person named Genevieve Roth, who is a founder of Invisible Hand to promote the couple. Roth was paid to oversee the Sussex's strategy on storytelling. Do you need a strategy on storytelling? Can't you just tell what happened? Okay, but this Genevieve has been embroiled in her own personal hell for years since like 2020 right and she's been over here recrafting the narrative about her own life and about her own self and about her own worth for a long time now and in 2020 she decided to give an interview to good housekeeping magazine really who even reads up anymore but she gives this interview and in the interview she says that i am riff with internalized racism and unconscious bias She's married to an African-American man, but she confessed that race is an issue in our marriage because as a white woman of privilege, I have racist tendencies written in at a cellular level. So our marriage is just fraught because I'm a horrible, vicious racist. I chose to marry a black man, but inside he, I can say I love him, but my cells say I hate him. Right? But this is the person that has been recruited to help Harry and Meghan and their strategy on storytelling. But what kind of mental patient have they hired? This is a person who by every measure of, a, of her visible existence would say one thing, that she is not a vicious racist, yet she continues to tell herself that she is. What reliable strategy of storytelling can we expect from this person? In New York's prevailing atmosphere, Roth was helped by Time Magazine's editors. Every year, Time historically among America's most prestigious publications, named the nation's 100 most influential people. And the Sussex staff had worked hard to persuade Time's editors that Harry and Meghan ranked as number one. If they were America's number one icon, just look at us. Don't we seem very American? He's from England and he's a prince and he's in exile. But other than that, we're definitely America's number one icon. Well, they succeeded against all odds, but only because they paid for their nominations and only because they had to literally bribe people to get them to say a kind word. In the distant past, the nominations would be written by famous political or cultural personality. But the best time could produce to nominate the Sussexes was Jose Andreas, a, a chef who pioneered the charity World Central Kitchen, also known as WCK. Uh, and he was first financed with $25,000 from Archwell. Andreas's operation belied the title. Beyond America, WCK had only opened small kitchens in Haiti, Puerto Rico, and Tonga. So not really sure about this world part of the World Central Kitchen, but whatever. Anyway, he wrote his little glowing nomination. And why anybody cared what this random chef who'd been given $25,000, why did anybody care what he had to say? I'll never know. I mean, it's, 
e even with his paltry nomination, were there not any better candidates with better backing? Well, anyway, he comes out and he uh, praises the Sussexes um, and he says that the couple were, quote, blessed through birth and talent, but burned by fame. The Duke and Duchess have compassion for people that they don't know. They don't just opine. They run toward the struggle. They give voice to the voices through media production. Did somebody write this statement for him? What would he know about giving a voice to the voiceless through media production? What media production has he even seen to validate that statement? Critics might question associating the Sussexes with struggle, but Claire and Nina Hallworth, famous for creating the image of Jennifer Aniston in 2019, were hired to produce the perfect image for the Sussexes cover photo. So against all odds, they were selected as America's number one icon, even though the only person they had to back them was this Jose Andreas. The stylists, oh God, and we all remember this picture that the stylists put together for Harry and Meghan, all right? It was the most pitiful, sorriest, clunkiest photo, quite frankly. She didn't look great. He looks stupid. Uh, he's positioned in the background, all in black. He's, and, and he's standing behind Meghan dressed in white. Megan had clearly had a change of heart about the stylists. Three years earlier, she had told Knopf that she didn't use stylists, you know, because it was personally frustrating for her to hear the word stylist since that was the only thing she had any control over was her personal style. But in this instance, she's there to let Claire and Nina Hallworth help her out. Uh, Claire and Nina, I'm disappointed. This is the best you could do. Megan, the outfit was not flattering to Megan. I remember thinking that it made her look like she doesn't need to be in one color. And I'm not trying to be petty. Like, really, like we all have specific body shapes and we can either dress them so that they look one way and we can dress them so that they look another. As I've mentioned many the time, I'm very pear-shaped. I know that about myself, so I wouldn't wear something that would accentuate that in a really negative way, right? I would want to wear something that would accentuate like my my waist size versus my hip size, right? Well, Megan, to put Megan all in one color doesn't help bring out maybe her better features. And so she just looked like a great big white log standing there. And then Harry in the background, Timothy like, can I come out, mommy? Is it all right? Can I say, is it okay if I peek out, wave at the camera? He looks stupid. And, you know, the meme went around and around that she, he looked like a stylist showing her her, her like her new layers, you know, because he, he literally was standing behind her like, let's look at your hair. Let's look at you, you know. Well, Time Magazine was the prelude for the Sussexes' next big event, a mini royal three-day tour of New York starting on the 22nd of September. Now, you guys, as I was reading about this, flabbergasted is what I was. Because why in the world are they doing a mini royal tour? They are not royals. Why are we even giving them a tiny bit of that kind of attention. Who are they representing? If people come over to America on a royal tour, if say like William and Catherine wanna come, they are representing the queen in the palace, right? Uh, that's why we allow it. That's why we pay for all their security and everything like this. It's, why in the world do we have two nobodies getting the royal tour? Like if any couple in Hollywood decided that they wanted to like show up in New York and like just kind of like go around we're not going to do any interviews no it's this is not interviews okay this photographs only photographs only uh and then like we're uh, New York City is expected to provide police escorts everywhere and all the cameras clicking away and they're seen like going up to a school and going up to the 9-11 you know memorial and walking down the street you know, it's like why though for whose benefit who, you know, it's like, if that's William and Catherine, it's for the benefit of the palace, it's like diplomatic purposes, but there's no purpose between behind letting Harry and Meghan act like this. So why? Why did anybody agree to this? Anyway, they come, they want to play royals. And again, like I said, the media was restricted to just photographs of no interviews. Based at the Carlisle, Princess Diana's favorite hotel, where else would they stay? The Sussexes were assured by the city's power brokers of maximum security. Their SUV convoy would be surrounded by police motorcyclists, sealing off roads as they drove across Manhattan. Exactly why? Why was this allowed? Sealing off roads, Manhattan? For a couple of nobodies? And why are the taxpayers having to let Harry and Meghan continue to cosplay that they're important royals? They aren't. Why are we financing this? Who allowed this? 
On the first visit early on Thursday morning to the Twin Towers Observatory, they were welcomed by Bill de Blasio, New York's mayor and the state governor, Kathy Hochul. Treated as members of the British royal family, they were escorted to the 9-11 Memorial and on the 102nd floor of the Freedom Tower of the World Trade Center. After paying their respects, they walked from the building to their police guarded convoy. Even that, like, why are you doing that? Why do you need to pay respects here at this monument? And why do we all have to watch you pay respects? And what exactly does that mean? Did you just go out and you're like, oh, okay, let's go. If you want to do that, fine. If you want to go and just like take a minute to remember the people whose lives were lost and, the, and, and that tragic terrorist attack, by all means, take some time to think about this, the holiness and the sacredness of all those lives that were lost and all of those souls that were lost to us that day. Like, if you want to do that, fine. But to take a camera crew with you is so crude and, and vulgar. It's vulgar. It's like, do, okay, it's like there's some things that are just private. You know what I mean? And I think that paying respects to the fallen um, is, a, it's, I feel like that's pretty private because it's not, to, it, you shouldn't be getting any accolades for caring for others. That should just be who you are as a mature adult. You look for others and you look for opportunities to care for others, right? And sometimes that can include caring for the people who have, who we've lost, right? But that's not something to take a picture of. It's just so gross when people need praise and adoration for doing the things that decent human beings would just do. All right. Uh, so they finished getting their accolades for caring about the people in 9-11. Onlookers were surprised that Megan was wearing a turtleneck and thick overcoat despite the 80 degree humid weather. Yeah, I mean, they might have gone in September, but that didn't mean it felt like September, right? Dress for what's happening. Over the three days, she would continue to wear heavy winter clothes, pieces by Armani, Laura Piana, and Max Mara over Valentino dresses. Accessories were Valentino, Cartier, and Man Man Manalo Blahnik. As Megan walked with Harry, they were overheard on a microphone and Harry was, that Harry was wearing for the Netflix documentary. They were speaking in strained voices where they discussed a plan to take Lilibet to Britain for her baptism, but of course that did not happen. Hmm, could it be because <laughs> Lilibet does not exist? Now I know that's a conspiracy theory and I don't know that I even believe it, but it is odd that we never see the child. What's gonna happen when those kids have to go to school? I was like for the longest like you guys need to quit it with all this like fake pregnancy stuff okay she was pregnant but the longer I look into who Harry and Meghan are as people and the scams that they're running and like as this book finishes off like we find out about just the financial scheming that's going on it wouldn't even like I, I'm past the point of disbelieving that they could have fabricated not only the pregnancies but also having the children in the first place where are they? Megan is so narcissistic that if she had kids, we'd be seeing those kids everywhere. Okay, she'd be posting pictures of her and the kids constantly. She'd be like looking for people to notice her and like what a good mother she is. I mean, we would see that all of the time. She does not possess the capability of keeping those children private. She just doesn't have it in her. So for us to believe that he or she's had these kids load these many years and we've never seen hide in her hair because she cares so much about their privacy, that's a bunch of bullshit. Okay, well, after they get done capering around in ridiculous clothes that are completely out of season, and the only thing I can think is that she'd been paid by these various people to wear those heavy clothes as kind of like for the fall line, you know, like let, let, let her be a walking advertisement for the fall. So she had to wear these heavy coats despite the 80 degree humid weather. Um, that is the only reason why she could have possibly been wearing those clothes. Uh, after they get done with that, they stop at the UN building to meet America's ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas Grenfield. Um, and then to discuss about COVID, the COVID vaccine with Chelsea Clinton at the offices of the World Health Organization, which included the virtual appearance of the WHO's director general. Okay, uh, why though? I mean, what, was Harry going to be over there being like, oh, well, now that I'm here, you guys will be able to figure out this whole vaccine thing. Should we have boosters or not? How many boosters should we get? Now that I'm here, we can figure it out. The following day, the couple visited the Mahalia Jackson Elementary School in Harlem. This is so cringy, y'all. So Megan was filmed reading The Bench to a class of children. <laughs> I bet they were bored to tears. Reporters were told that the Sussexes had donated a washing and drying machine two garden boxes filled with vegetables and herbs and copies of her book. Oh, will be. 
How generous. Y'all, seriously, out of all of the largesse that they have, the best they could do is donate a, dry, a washing and drying machine. Only two garden boxes with vegetables and herbs. Two garden boxes? How's that going to help the kids? Like, if they're supposed to be gardening and stuff, like, what if they had built a garden at the school? Like, that is the, that, that is the level at which they should be functioning. A couple of garden boxes. And what are the dimensions of the garden boxes? I don't know. But what? And then copies of her book. This is the best they could do. They have millions of dollars. But all they can do is chuck an old washer and dryer, you know, at the poor kids in Harlem and here's some vegetables, you know. Hope y'all know what to do with this. But what they were criticized for was not the garden boxes and the washing and drying machine, but for giving those kids copies of the book. Critics questioned whether the school children from broken homes would welcome a narrative of a happy family and whether Megan's $15,000 outfit was appropriate. Okay, well, I think we can all agree that the $15,000 outfit's ridiculous. Just go meet with the kids and be like a nice, normal person. Um, but I don't agree with this, cr this critique that school children from broken homes have to be bitter about a book about a happy family. See, that's broken thinking because, so because they might come from broken homes, then they always have to read books and marinate in literature that is a reflection of them. God forbid it. I mean, I don't want to read books about, you know, the worst things about my life and that like, even when I read a book, I can't even ascend to something higher. So critics, why don't you shut it? See, that's probably, I mean, that's part of what our culture's problem is with books is that we think literature has to reflect our circumstances rather than being inspired by literature it has to only be at our level or worse because god forbid i feel bad about a book i read where somebody's better off than i am in it oh my gosh we, why can't we think what's wrong with our country okay after that they went and ate some southern fried chicken and waffles at melba a harlem's comfort food restaurant by the way while they're at melba's they pledged twenty five thousand dollars for the restaurant's covid relief fund but again pledged or given hmm we may never know the highlight of the tour was on Saturday afternoon in front of a 60,000 person crowd in Central Park, a Global Citizen Live concert promoted vaccine equality. So I guess Harry was just making the rounds of these live concerts talking about vaccine equality because this is about the fifth time I've read about him showing up. The Sussexes were cheered for urging manufacturers to donate free vaccines to poor countries. He comes out saying the ultra wealthy pharmaceutical companies are not sharing the recipes to make them. Recipes is the word he used. Adopting Megan's language, he continued, when we start making decisions through that lens, every single person deserves equal access to the vaccine. None of the audience appeared to question how Harry, trading on his inherited title and inherited wealth, was qualified to launch a socialistic campaign. Well, and I also think too, it's like, I, I'm, I'm, cons I'm confused by who, who was being denied the vaccine if they wanted it. If you wanted the vaccine, people were more than willing to jab you with it. I mean, you could go to any place and they'd give it to you. Who was being denied this? The, the real problem was, is that people didn't want it. And the government was annoyed because they were saying, but you have to have it. You know, all these other countries, let me tell you. Pfizer would have been more than happy to package up the vaccines and take it to another country. Um, they probably just couldn't get paid what they wanted for it. Before the concert ended, the couple was driven to Teterboro Airport. As they flew on their private jet back to Santa Barbara, the COP26 climate summit was meeting in Glasgow. Um, they weren't there for it, but Archwell was only willing to speak about them at the conference saying that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have a long-standing commitment to the planet. Archwell announced that the Sussexes would be net zero by 2030 and be offsetting their carbon footprint. Uh, what though? Like, what does that even mean? Okay, like, I don't know a lot of things about a lot of things, okay? But I've never been quite certain about what exactly is this net zero by 2030 offsetting carbon footprint. Like, how though? What does that mean? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what changes are you ch planning to make so that everything that you've done thus far will completely offset your carbon footprint? I'm not seeing a change in lifestyle. I'm not seeing a change in the number of times you're jetting across the country. Like, what are you talking about? You know, I might not be the sharpest crown in the box, but I can tell that you're saying things, but not giving me clear answers. How exactly are you planning to make this a reality? If you would only just stop flying on these private jets, you could do a whole lot for the planet. 
I mean, according to these people's standards. One month later, the Suskas returned to New York by private jet to star in a gala for veterans. Walking into the hall dressed in a stunning red designer dress, Megan was hailed by the New York Times as an A-list celebrity and social activist. Well, I guess we were reading different news because that's not what I read when everybody saw her in that quote, stunning red designer dress. All I heard were people saying, why didn't somebody help her choose something that was more flattering? The same newspaper invited the Duchess of Sussex to appear on a platform with Melody Hobson, the charity of Starbucks, co-chief executive of an investment fund and the wife of Star Wars director George Lucas. By the way, her neighbor. Together, they urged the Biden administration to pay for family leave as a humanitarian issue. On that same day, at a rewired conference, Harry attacked the British media for creating news with a vested interest to provoke Meghan's untimely death. The incentives for publishing are not necessarily aligned with the incentives of truth. Misinformation is a global humanitarian crisis. Don't these people ever get tired of saying the same stupid words? Like, I'd be bored of myself. Their two speeches in New York coincided with the opening of the appeal court hearing of Megan's case against the mail on Sunday. Okay, so that's them running around the globe being ridiculous. Despite all every, despite everybody's criticism, it's just full steam ahead. Okay, well, over there in England, the case is coming to court. You guys, this is chapter 41. It's called Victory. It's super disappointing and depressing. As it begins, it's a very short chapter, and I'll go through it briefly. The judges don't care to adjudicate this matter. It, it's clear from the onset that they are ready to brush this thing clear under the carpet. They're done with it. They don't care about it. And the judges in the case hadn't ever really shown that they cared that much for the interest of free speech anyway. So to have them coming in, remember Warby had all let us down. So now they're thinking, they're trying to get the case re-looked at. These judges don't care. They could not care less. So we shouldn't have been surprised that it didn't work out. Andrew uh, Colcott was trying to get the judges to understand why they needed to hear the case again, that the evidence, all the evidence had not been thoroughly looked at and that some of the most pertinent evidence had been set aside as unimportant when in fact it was the entire case. He felt that Warby had done an injustice to the newspaper and to the public. And so Calcott spelled out the importance of Jason Knopf's statement that had been ignored. He argued that Judge Warby had been misled by Megan's statement to the court. He also showed how Warby had ignored some of Thomas Markle's text messages. The judge was wrong, Cal Calcott said, to deny the male the right to cross-examine Megan and produce the testimony of the palace for in a trial. It's like, how can you say that everything is an unimportant and dismiss the trial when you haven't even really tested the evidence or tested the people involved? The judges openly dismiss Calcott's argument with the importance of Jason Knopf's description of his multiple discussions with Megan. The judges preferred to latch onto Megan's excuses for her misleading the court in her signed statement. So remember, she'd signed and said, I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't... Never talked to Jason about the book that Elman Scobie was doing. I never knew anything about what my friends were up to. I just never knew. I never knew. I never knew. You know, here I am, this doe-eyed innocent. You know, it's like, that's what she always relies on. So once she'd been caught, Jason Knopf's coming out being like, wait, well, I have emails that say you did know. And the Palace Four have a word to say. Then Megan comes out and she writes a statement to the court. I had forgotten about the email exchanges that I had with Mr. Knopf and his meeting with the authors. When I approved the passage, I did not have the benefit of seeing these emails and I apologized to the court for the fact that I had not remembered these exchanges at the time. I had absolutely no wish or intention to mislead the defendant or the court. Sorry, oops. How did you forget that though? Like, and to say I didn't have any emails, like if I was going to court over something, I would have searched my own emails to make sure that every bit of correspondence I had with the people in the exchange, that I could remember what I had said so that I wouldn't perjure myself, but she didn't even care. It's like to be like, I didn't have the emails, but didn't you though? Weren't they in your inbox? Couldn't you have searched for them? A person doing their due diligence would have been like, oh, Jason Kanoff's coming after me. I better make sure that I remember everything that we ever said so that in my own defense, I can point out what a snake he is, right? But, oh, oops, 
No one showed me my emails that I wrote, so I didn't know what I'd said. It just is one of those things that happened, just slipped my mind, you know? Sometimes that happens. I don't know, have you ever had that happen where you just like totally forgot like a massive event having happened? Some people call it amnesia, but I think it's just one of those things that can sometimes happen when you're just really important and famous. The judges accepted Megan's explanation beyond all understanding because no time in the history of courts in England has anybody been able to come out and be like, oops, I forgot, and judges accepted that. Like this was a new precedent. The newspaper lost its appeal. According to the judges, Megan was empowered to determine the narrative and the media were not allowed to challenge her truth in a trial. Megan's right of privacy was more important than press freedom and the public interest. The newspaper would not be given the chance to defend itself. No other claimant in an English court had ever escaped a trial in justice because of an unfortunate lapse in memory. Many were outraged that once again, the rich and powerful had won. Insider said that the outstanding victor was Judge Warby, protected by his fellow judges, and that the true victim in all of this was Thomas Markle because he had no redress for the defamation published by People magazine. Yes, why, didn't, why does what Meghan want trump what Thomas Markle wants? Meghan says, people aren't allowed to come out and say things about me that aren't true. But why then were your friends allowed to come out and make whatever statement they wanted about your dad? That doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no logic to that. And the fact that the judges would be willing to honor Megan, the rich and powerful, versus Thomas Markle, who is poor and, you know, blundering and has said a lot of things that are unflattering to him. It doesn't matter. The law should be applied to both equally in both sides, regardless of whether one is more shiny and sparkly than the other. I mean, that's just common sense. All right, well, his disgruntled reply to all of this was that Markle's died at 80, and so he only had three years left to live, and that he was never going to see his daughter again or his grandchildren. Of course, Meghan Markle was euphoric. I mean, this was yet one more victory for her. This is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who's ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. She said that the Mail on Sunday had dragged out the case and twisted the facts to generate more headlines. She said that it was a model that rewards chaos above truth. And in the nearly three years since this began, I have been patient in the face of deception, intimidation, and calculated attacks. These harmful practices don't happen once in a blue moon. They are a daily fact that divides us and we all deserve better. She urged a change of law. While this win is precedent setting, what matters most is that we are now collectively brave enough to reshape a tabloid industry that c conditions people to be cruel and profits from the lies and pain that they create. We've got to do better. We all have to educate ourselves. The Times in London criticized the Duchess for attacking the media. They said that it's improper to exploit the platform granted by hereditary privilege in her case through marriage to press a political case. Well, but of course, Meghan felt that it wasn't a political case. She felt like it was a matter of decency. Um, I mean, that's what she would have us believe. But what's interesting is, I wonder if she got her way, if the press stopped paying any attention to her, what then? How does she manage to go on? Well, one of the tools in her arsenal is just to pay for what she wants, you know? And interestingly, a substantial argument against the British media and in Megan's defense was written for New York Magazine by Sophia Emoja Noble an associate professor of gender studies and African studies at UCLA, the director of the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, and the author of, wait for it, this is about the dullest title you've ever heard. She wrote, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. I have literally never heard a title I'd like to read less. But anyway, Noble wrote this uh, and has defended Harry and Meghan without end. She asserted that Meghan had been targeted by an unprecedented sexist and racist Twitter campaign fueled by harassment and hate. Black women, she wrote, were relentlessly targeted online. Uh, she used the, this annoying term, uh, miso misogynoir. That means misogyny against black people. Black women, misogynoir. Okay. The attack on a black woman suing for her privacy and winning is too much for the tabloids to bear, wrote Noble. She did not mention in her article that her studies were part financed by the Artwell Foundation to illuminate the problems of inequality and structural racism. Is there no one that they have not bribed? You know, so here this person comes out all against the times, writes an entire book 
Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism, funded by Archwell. Of course she's going to come out and say, well, Harry and Meghan have always been the target, specifically Meghan, of what we would call massage noir. Meghan's triumph was sealed by her appearance on the Ellen DeGeneres TV show. Oh, you guys. Okay, so Meghan wants us all to believe that she was under continual and constant harassment as part of the royal family. And that it didn't just stop there. The tabloids were relentless in their bullying campaign against her and that she has never in all of her life known such racism, such hate, such, be such belittling. It's never been worse and it couldn't be worse. Then she went on the Ellen show. Let's hear about how that went. Okay, so she goes, she gets on the Ellen show. Both women, neighbors in Montecito, were united by accusations of bullying. Both were also desperate to stay relevant for the American public. In the celebrity economy, remarkable additional effort was required by middle-aged women to secure the publicity which kept their status at the top of the index. Many, Megan knew, disliked the fickle superficiality of maintaining one's celebrity, but since her childhood in ABC studio, she had embraced that world. The trick was to avoid obsolescence by constantly refreshing her appeal. But why she thought that this appearance would appeal to us, I have no idea. Fearing that her New York success two months earlier had been forgotten, Meghan agreed to an extraordinary subversion of her royal image. And that really is the best description of it. It was a superbly crafted subversion of her royal image. Uh, and not for her benefit, you know, for, for, for Ellen's. Because Ellen made her look like an absolute barking fool and Megan agreed to it. And you know, Ellen, I've never liked Ellen. Uh, so when everybody came out and was like, well, she's a bully, I'm like, yeah, didn't y'all know that? She's really mean to people on her show. Like it should have been obvious that she was probably a nightmare behind the scenes. But for Ellen to have done this is just like, I don't care how you feel about Megan. Like this is kind of a bad look on Ellen that Ellen would make anybody look like this. And, but for Megan to agree to it though, that's the other embarrassing thing. Why did she agree to this? So she gets on the show, you know, she of course has her stupid studio interview with DeGeneres and she co covers all the familiar milestones. At 11 years old, I wrote about the dishwashing liquid wasn't just for women to wash dishes and I changed the world. And then I had to eat my scissor salad and then I had to work at the yogurt shop and then I had to run around Hollywood with a car that wouldn't work. So I had to climb in and out in and out of the back of the SUV because the doors wouldn't work. And it's like, why don't you just take your car to a mechanic and get them to fix it? What about that option? Anyway, so she's got like all of her well-trotted out stories, okay? So she gets done with that. But the worst part of it was that Ellen, I guess, thought this would be a really funny bit to send Megan out into the street and Ellen would tell her something she had, like she was wearing an earpiece. And then Ellen would tell her in her earpiece, okay, now you have to do this, now you have to do that. And Megan had to do it. And Ellen made Megan look so stupid. Uh, it's like, I cannot even believe anybody would have agreed to this. Like I would have like, if I had not known what it was that I was doing, which I'm like, how could a person not have known? But if for some reason it had all been lost to me and nobody had told me, nobody briefed me what this was going to be, I would have stopped in the middle of the street and just been like, mm -mm, no, I'm not doing this. This is, this is undignified to me as a human being. Like, this is not acceptable that you would ask me to do any of this. And I'm not without a sense of humor, but this just isn't funny. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is not even, nobody would laugh at this, except for maybe like those embarrassed giggles you get when you're just like, this is the most humiliating thing I've ever seen. I have to laugh or I'm gonna like explode. Um, This is not funny and this is not good TV. This is just the humiliation of one person over another. So. Dressed in Oscar de la Renta top, Megan left the studio and went into the street. Instructed via an earpiece connected to DeGeneres, she was ordered to interact with the market traders selling quartz crystals and hot sauces. Let's get the spiciest, let's get the hottest, screeched Megan with eye-opening foolery. Ordered by DeGeneres to eat like a chipmunk, she chanted at the bemused traders, Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. The studio audience cheered. Viewers were baffled. I'm feeling hot, 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 shouted Megan as she danced alone. Obeying DeGeneres' order to squat and touch her nose while swigging from a baby's bottle, she intoned, Mommy wants some milk! The studio audience was encouraged to cheer more. Viewers were even more perplexed. Her finale was to act like a cat. For one minute, she recited, I'm a kitten, meow, meow, meow. I'm a kitten, meow, meow, meow. 
Oh, but, but Kate was a bully. Kate made her cry. But Ellen DeGeneres telling her to go squat in the street and suck from a baby bottle while saying mommy wants some milk is totally fine. We're friends. That's what friends do. Okay, uh, this is humiliation beyond comprehension. And for Megan to say that people had mistreated her in the royal family, uh, but to not see that this was unbelievably humiliating and done to her by somebody who was, you know, supposedly her equal. Not even, this wasn't even a hierarchical issue here. She let somebody do this to her. You know, it's like with the royal family, she's like, there was a hierarchy there and I just couldn't get ahead. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, that is true. There is a hierarchy there, but nobody in that hierarchy ever treated you the way this equal has decided to treat you. And you agreed to it. For what, money? You have, have you no self-worth at all. Ooh, I mean, that, like, we, how the, how the mighty have fallen. Okay, so that is the end of those two chapters. And then the next time we come together, we'll have two more chapters and then we're done. And then we can start with our other book. Thank the Lord. I cannot wait because I'm done with this couple. Um, it, look, here's the thing. If Harry ever decides to write another book, you got to believe that we'll be reading it. Of course we will. We couldn't leave that to the wayside. But for a time, I'm so glad to be done and I'm ready to get on with Trader King. So one more episode of Revenge and then we're free, free as the wind blows. And I just cannot wait. We, but champions, we're such champions. We got through this book and we got through it together. So one more and then we'll be officially done. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Um, thank you for hanging in there with me last week. I'm sorry I didn't have any episodes, but it was good to get away. It was good not to think about this book. <laughs> and it was good to just hang out with the family. Uh, but I missed y'all. So uh, it's good to see you guys again, and I'll see you later this week. Bye.